When we were doing our research for episode one, Matt and I stumbled upon this guy you've probably never heard of, Clarence Saunders, who founded Piggly Wiggly. If that sounds a bit esoteric, what that means for us today is that we feel his mark pretty much any time we go shopping, from your neighborhood corner store to Costco or even online. And his story, too, is just so damn rich. The story of a guy who went from rags to riches and then fell from grace and eventually into obscurity undeserving of his achievements. So we decided to dig into him a little bit more. And to do that, we found a guy named Mike Freeman, a Memphis-based historian and author who literally wrote the book on Clarence Saunders. The only book on Clarence Saunders that we could find. That interview, edited as always, is what follows. I'm Jeremy Sparrowin. I'm Matt Levine. This is Cornucopia. Glad to have you, Mike. One of the things in our first episode when we did a broad overview of the history of the supermarket in America, we realized Clarence Saunders is way too good to not devote some more time to. I sometimes tell people he had the chance to do what Sam Walton did with Walmart. They both had the idea that you could sell anything with self-service. He changed all that. He was born in 1881. Give us a little bit about what it was like for him growing up. There's a story of the man born in a log cabin who becomes a president or a millionaire. And that's his background. There's a story he didn't have shoes one winter and his neighbor bought him some shoes. He dropped out of school uh, at 14. And then by the time he was 19, he was working for a wholesale grocer in uh, Clarksville itself. And then at age 20 or so, he took a job as a salesman in Memphis. So he was always working and always educating himself. Up to the founding of Piggly Wiggly, he was basically working for a distributor? He worked for a company that was selling uh, all sorts of products wholesale. And there's a key point in Saunders' narrative. He was curious about the way stores were arranged. And he developed a reputation for being a bit brash. And he'd go into a store and say, you know, you could do better if you move this display from there over to here. And, you know, was, you can imagine this store owner who's been in business all his life, you know, who the hell does he think he is? <laughs> Tell me how to arrange my store. But he came to Memphis in 1904, and by the year 1914, he was part owner of a company. So he went from being a sales salesman to, you know, leaving that position and starting his own wholesale company. Where does Memphis fit into the rest of the American landscape at this particular moment in history? Memphis in the year 1900 was the fifth largest wholesale market in the United States. And it was not a large city, but we were right in the middle of this very large agricultural area. So you had products coming into Memphis, and then you had finished products going out into the small town right in the middle of the country. And a lot of the movement then was still by steamboat, and a lot of it was railroads. We had two rail bridges that crossed the river. There were very few bridges that crossed the river uh, in 1900. There's one in St. Louis, and Memphis had the second and third bridge. So that meant a lot of traffic came into the city and then went out again. I mean, salesmen from Memphis went as far as East Texas. It's a large territory to cover. And Mike, forgive this uh, coastal ignorance. That's the Mississippi? That's the Mississippi, yeah. Okay. <laughs> right, right in the middle of the country. It's, yeah, well, I mean, it's, it I is strategic. So, but... I figured Third largest it, river system in the world, and yeah, it's strategic. It's gotcha. Right there. And, You're talking and, to two East Coasters who are living in California right yeah. now. So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that fascinated me in learning about Saunders is, A, I used to sell wholesale groceries in the 80s and 90s. Oh, okay. And in contemporary America, there's almost nothing nastier than a grocery manager or a grocery buyer. So I was really, really struck by the fact that he was, as you mentioned, he's telling these folks how to run their business. But those that took his advice found they were selling a lot more groceries. Can you tell us a little bit about how that led to the eventual creation of Piggly Wiggly in 1916? He was, in my opinion, like a self-taught efficiency expert. He was always thinking of ways to improve whatever business he was in. He was always thinking of ways to, to do it a little bit better. And I think that's what motivated him to eliminate the clerks. He wasn't really uh, happy with the service you could get in these old stores. 
Um, you know, when the, the business is slow, he said, the clerks are standing around yakking to each other, not paying attention to the few customers in the store. If the business is busy, then the clerks are just overwhelmed. <laughs> they can't fill all the orders fast enough. Um, supposedly led to the name Piggly Wiggly. The story is, is he was riding a train thinking about these problems of efficiency and he noticed uh, piglets feeding off a of mother sow and that reminded him of customers rushing to one store clerk at the same time trying to place the orders. And he said, aha, he's got, he had his name, Piggly Wiggly. He had the name, the store design, and just a matter of days. What I think we can't fully understand in the contemporary mindset, it was pretty revolutionary. No counters. You could grab the products off the shelf. Everything had a price on it. It was this massive innovation. Compared to the other uh, companies at the time, where basically they printed price lists, Saunders was very, he stood out. And he, he came up with the idea of the turnstile. The store was arranged where you walked in past the turnstile down aisle one, and you had to keep going. You round the corner of the back of the store, and you had to walk down aisle two. And then you zigzag to aisle three and then aisle four. So you had to walk this pattern to get everyone to walk through every part of the store so they would get in the habit of picking out items for themselves. Because most shoppers in Memphis never shop self-service. They were used to being waited on. And he was breaking people of that habit. One of the, the remarkable things about Saunders was his art of promotion and the grand openings that he would have with these stores. Um, I'm sure the flower wholesalers loved him. Give a flower to every lady that walks in. Uh, he had a beauty contest. Practically every woman won something. <laughs> he was almost like a frustrated writer. He, he did love to draw attention to his stories with outlandish stories. He, he wrote nursery rhymes. He, he wrote these parables about, you know, the moral of the story is you should always shop at Piggly Wiggly where they'll save you money. But, you know, he was a product of the south i mean one of his ads he talks about slaying the demon of high prices and it's all in bold letters with explanation points it's one of those old fire and brimstone sermons you know his ears have been slashed off his eyes gouged Over out his mutilated form stand scores and scores of mourners who tear at their hair and bite their fingernails where they yearn for the days when the demon of high prices ruled with an iron grip on the hungry throats of the commoner who took from him who had to sell a small portion of his money, whether or not he should have received from him a larger one. Mourners of the dead, dry away your tears, and if the grocery business doesn't look good to you anymore, be happy that the customer will now have a show and will henceforth from his throne at Piggly Wiggly wield his scepter in the interest of his own stomach and his own pocketbook. And he's preaching. There's another one, I'm not dead yet, and you shouldn't be too, I think after he lost the Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> he, he was, you know... Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, if people look at our website, you can see some of the ads where it's a full page ad, but about a third of the page has nothing to do with grocery prices. It has to do with no. homespun sermons, philosophizing, sharing his points of view, disparaging the competition, telling people they shouldn't be anti-Catholic when Al Smith was running for president. He was just larger than light. He used his uh, advertising space as almost like a politician would. He, he used a couple of issues and ads in 1917 to sell war bonds. How did the public react to all this? You know, Saunders risked controversy when he, he actually did campaign. Levis was ruled for many, many years by a political boss, Edward H. Crump, a behind-the-scenes businessman whose organization counted the votes. So he didn't challenge Crump, but... Saunders did, and he wrote these ads calling Crump all sorts of bizarre names. I mean, you think negative campaigning is an issue today. Right? It was quite an issue in the 1920s at times. One of the things you talk about very well, Mike, was how when he tried to corner the stock, right. you know, that it was very, it seemed like it was very much like our man Clarence against the big Wall Street banks. It seemed very much like a, almost a folk tale, a populist tale of a guy who started something put memphis on the map much like coke put atlanta on the map as you note in your book and it seemed like yeah. there was a real affection for a guy who in some cynical point of view you might say he was kind of working customers to get them to buy more but people didn't see it that way they saw him as a, a kind of a local hero 
you know, some businessmen could probably be seen as aloof, you know, they're bankers that never show their face and, you know, Saunders would go right out and talk to people. So he did play the populist angle, um, you know, us against the, the Wall Street traders. Um, <laughs> he was definitely the the hero of the working people. Problem with all that, though, is that Saunders created his own problems. Like everything else he did, he read about how to trade stocks. He thought he knew the rules. What he didn't understand is the Wall Street traders made the rules and interpret them as they saw fit. He was warned not to corner his stock. He was actually warned in advance. So um, I'm not as sympathetic to Saunders as I once was because he, he ignored that warning. And of course, they, they did exactly what they said they were going to do to him. In reading your book, it struck me that this is the guy, if someone told them no, he was going to say yes, just as a reflex. Yeah. Tell me I can't do it. He's going to do it anyway. One of the interesting things you note is when he was suing uh, certain imitators for patent infringement. On many, uh, many people were copying his self-service model, and of oh, all yes. the imitators, my favorite was Hogley Wogley. <laughs> uh, but when he was suing them, not he didn't just rely on his lawyers, even though he was the third largest supermarket in America. He enrolled in a correspondence course for business law. It, it, it throughout your book, it consistently amazes me how confident Brash and how his hubris, you know, like Icarus, he kind of just flew too close to that sun in, in yeah. many of his ventures. You have to admire him for being constantly pushing to learn and you know, not being satisfied with, you know, no, you know, being ignorant. I mean, he was, he was convinced, he, yeah, he can take a correspondence course in business law and he'd know as much as his patent lawyers have done it all his life. <laughs> I mean, that's how confident he was. Uh, He's cornered the market. The, the stock price is not worth what it is. So he has all the stock in Piggly Wiggly. And then he decides he's going to try and sell it to his customers and local business people. And yes. there's a big banquet you detail with 350 people come out to support this guy. And yes. they're going to keep Memphis's Piggly Wiggly with Saunders. And then right. a workman on the Pink Palace is injured building this palatial mansion. I think it had a five acre man made lake in it. I think you, you know, it was just very much like the robber barons of Newport, Rhode Island oh, yeah. type of home. So people realize while Saunders had everybody volunteering their time and the community coming together to support him to try and save the store, that he was still building this gigantic mansion. And then <laughs> things turned against him. Well, the, the, the enthusiasm just just appeared like popping a balloon. Uh, suddenly they realized, well, you know, what the hell are you doing? We're working you for nothing. And as it turns out, his former uh, partners in Piggly Wiggly, they filed suit. So the, the next five years, Saunders, was, or four years, was a series of lawsuits and bankruptcy hearings. When he was sued, he owed what would be the equivalent of about $35 million dollars. And while this was wrangling its way through a very labyrinthine, long court battle, he opened up the sole owner stores. And what's remarkable to me is you detail that he his first store, he was going to open it, even though there was a court injunction where the court ruled in Piggly Wiggly's, Wiggly's favor, said you cannot open the store, and he was going to open it anyways. And then... He sent some emissary to the judge on a Friday before the Saturday opening, and they temporarily allowed him to open stores. And while this was all going on, he had the grand opening where you describe he had a jazz band on top of one of the refrigerator units. He was there shaking people's hands, handing out carnations, and a couple thousand people showed up for the grand opening. He was kind of a master, and you know, having this huge bankruptcy a uh, settlement facing him, a court saying you can't open a store, and he goes ahead and does it. It must have been a hard time for Saunders because he really he put a lot of, of himself into Piggly Wiggly, and suddenly he's being forced out of it. There was a lot of hard feelings between Saunders and some of the other business people in the city that lasted for years. And that may be one of the reasons why some people didn't want to talk. The name of the second business comes directly out of his legal troubles um 
you know, he wrote this ad so they can take away everything, but they can't take away my name. And then there was always people willing to invest in Carl Saunders. Uh, he, he and his wife found enough money to open up a store. And he decided to call it Clarence Saunders, sole owner of my name store. And of course, he was sued again because there's still some uh, legal thought that he was tied to Piggly Wiggly and he can't very well open a second chain of stores and compete against Piggly Wiggly. Chart the success of the sole owner stores until the Depression. Give us a little overview and then we'll deal with his next brilliant creation in the mid 1930s. In the sole owner stores, you begin to see the evolution into uh, the supermarkets. He expanded the size of the stores. You know, he had a meat department. He hired butchers. You had a bakery and a deli department. So he had clerk service for certain the specialized sections, and then most of the interior is designed uh, for self-service. Isn't that the blueprint of a basic supermarket? Yeah, uh, and he had an ambitious plan that you detail. He had uh, the United States divided into seven regions. So, yeah. you know, that Wal- Sam Walton uh, analogy is, a, is not a, a casual one that you mention. It's very clear that he had his eyes on something really huge. And here he was trying to create what Walton would create with Walmart. You would have groceries on one part. Uh, he was creating the superstores. The last idea of sole owner was he's, one store was supposed to be 60,000 square feet. I'm not sure, it was not built, but that's what the newspaper said it was going to be, 20 check stands. He thought, well, I could sell automobile parts in one section, dry goods and some clothing in another and then groceries in another section. And and that's the blueprint, a rough blueprint of what Walmart was or is. Yeah, in today's supermarket world, 20 check stands would be what they call a superstore. Saunders was very proud of the fact that the sole owner stores had quite a bit of success. And he was very proud of the fact that those New York bankers were loaning him money again. They financed basically a nationwide expansion of the sole owners. But the market crashed in 1929, and by 1930, and banks were calling in their loans, and he was having trouble paying for them. And how does he take it when the when the sole owner stores eventually come down? Uh, I, I think he took it kind of hard. He went through a divorce, and he remarried rather quickly. And then, I, I can't really say for certain, but I was being told stories that he was uh, maybe drinking and having some anger management issues. With that borrowed money, he bought some land further out of the city and opened up an, another house. And he spent the next several years just trying to keep that home. All that money borrowed, just, he just couldn't generate enough business to pay back the loans. You know, for a while, he had a cleaning product called Evergreen, I believe. You know, the serial entrepreneur. Everglue or something. Yeah. Yeah, well, the family didn't really talk about those days very much. Imagine they were maybe trying to protect him, but he was becoming a little desperate and um, maybe he just didn't know what to do with himself. Uh, I don't know where the Caduzel idea originated. <laughs> yeah, Caduzel. This is, I love everything about Caduzel. Set the, set the stage for us. If you can imagine the supermarket operated as a vending machine, that was Caduzel. I really don't know where he got the idea, but <laughs> he thought that he could run with this electronic technology, a customer would be given a key and then they would go down an aisle and all the items were behind glass. You could see the item, but you couldn't touch it. But if you wanted a can of chicken noodle soup, you'd see the can in front of you, you'd stick the key in the slot. There's products placed in rows of chutes. And so if you activated the chicken noodle slot, then the can of chicken noodle soup would come down to a conveyor belt and eventually be brought to the cashier's desk for you. Uh, and he started selling the idea in 1936, and I think the first store opened up a couple of years later. Uh, it was a bit of a harder sell. His grandson says, well, you know, you, you don't even have transistors in 1938. You're dealing with wire and solder, and you've got 10,000 electrical connections. Something can go wrong any minute anywhere in the system. And then, you couldn't really operate the store properly. And that became his headache, was just trying to keep the store repaired. Were there technical troubles? The thing that comes to mind would be something like buying eggs from a World War II era vending machine would be 
a bit of a hazardous process? Many of the grocery items were sold in glass, you know, ketchup bottles, pickle jars, and things like that. And so the thought of having these things drop down a chute onto a conveyor belt, <laughs> you know, they had major problems with <laughs> trying to keep items from being from breaking yeah, apart. The technology was more expensive than actually having a staff. By that point in his life, I think just operating a chain of stores bored him. And he was telling his shoppers, why shop at these same old boring stores you've seen all the time? You know, And then he was saying that about himself. He, was, he didn't want to do that. He just didn't want to run a business and you know take his profits to the bank. He, he wanted to do something different. Was there a sense at the time that Clarence Saunders was ahead of his time? Or is that only something we, we recognize now in retrospect? There was a lot of... Uh, articles written about Saunders in the 1930s. In fact, most of the biography I learned about Saunders was from interviews he gave in the 30s. You had Life Magazine, Time, um, other national publications come to Memphis to interview this guy because, one, he's promoting a store no one had ever heard of before, like a science fiction type thing. And two, he was, he was a bit older, and they were doing these retrospective stories. Oh, he was able to tell his story. You know, by the 1930s, supermarkets were everywhere. So the way people would shop for food had completely changed. So Saunders suffers a heart attack and dies in 1953. But right up to the end, he was still working at it, trying to create a successor called Food Electric. What do you think he would feel about his legacy today? You know, we had the... 100th anniversary of Piggly Wiggly and the newspapers here ran a couple of stories. Maybe I'm not the best promoter for Saunders, but in some ways I think he's been overlooked. I, mean, I really do believe if he had held on to that first business, Piggly Wiggly, and grown it into a national company like Steve Jobs did with Apple, he would have been uh, higher in the echelon, I think. But he lost that first business and he never really got back to that level of success that we could continue to try. And with that, we're at an end ourselves. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you both. And anybody who wants to get a great tour of Memphis, Mike, how do they hit you up? MemphisRoadTours.com. And we'd like to thank you, too, for listening. Cornucopia is Matt Levine, myself, Jeremy spiro and soon, very, very soon, we'll be adding a third partner, Ashley Ellis. So stay tuned for that. Ashley is amazing. We'd also like to throw out a quick thank you to Nicole Whedon, who handles all of our designs. You can see her excellent work at our website, cornucopia.show. That's cornucopia.show. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or wherever else the kids do their social medias these days. Matt, was there anything else? Rate us on Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play, and other places where you listen to your favorite podcasts. Share us with your friends. Tell your lovers, your ex-lovers, your enemies, and your boss. They gotta listen to Cornucopia, the cult culture and business of food. Thanks. Thanks.